Jesus Christ came about this way after his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph. It was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and not uh, wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided uh, to divorce her secretly. But after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now, all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Now, when Joseph got up from sleeping, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but did not know her intimately until she gave birth to a son. And he was named Yahshua, or Jesus. Father, we pray that you would just bless the reading of your word. We ask God that we can glean from this scripture. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. I want to entitle the message this morning, kind of a strange title for a Christmas message, but I want to entitle the message this morning, When Unexpected Things Happen. Now, I know most of us can be cruising along and unexpected things happen. I was cruising along ready to go to Pigeon Forge for a fun a day or two, a couple of Saturdays ago, beautiful Saturday morning, and before we left, I needed to take Willie out to go to the bathroom. And we went for a little walk where we always go, and unexpectedly, a white German shepherd came from out of nowhere and attacked my dog. And I attacked the German shepherd, and the German shepherd won. So I think there was a song about that. I fought the dog and the dog won. No, it was I fought the law and the law won. Okay, but anyway, I didn't expect that. I didn't expect to have my finger broken that day. And I'm sure that many of you have gotten up in the morning not expecting what the day has ahead for you. And then all of a sudden, that day turns into either a nightmare or a joy, a great joy. So either way, unexpected things can happen. You know, Andy Williams, my wife and I were talking about all these great singers from the 40s and the 50s. Uh, we're talking about Bing Crosby, Frank Sinatra. Uh, one of the, those was a guy named Andy Williams. Now, Andy Williams uh, it's very, has a song that is very famous for this time of year. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Uh, it's the most wonderful time of the year with the kids jingle belling and everyone telling uh, you to be of good cheer. It's the most wonderful time of the year. But is it? According to statistics, it's the most depressing time of the year. Isn't that amazing? Why is that? It's because when things happen around holidays, it seems as though it just has a much greater impact on us. And we see that this time of the year brings to our minds tragic things that may have happened in our life during this time of the year. You've got uh, many different areas that uh, we can uh, unexpectedly be attacked in. Uh, divorce, death, sickness. Uh, we mentioned uh, a, a couple of things earlier. We mentioned Charlie. You know, here it is almost Christmas and Phyllis is going through uh, this very difficult time. Uh, and, and trust me, when your spouse is seriously ill, it's a very difficult time in your life. So unexpected things do happen. Now, I can promise you two things this morning. First off, if you knew everything about my family, I would be absolutely embarrassed. Now, you folks that are self-righteous say, hallelujah. 
But let me move to the second thing I want to tell you. If I knew everything about your family, you would be embarrassed. Say amen right there if you don't mind. That's just the way it is. Now, in Matthew, Matthew presents the background of our Savior, God, Emmanuel, God with us, that came, walked among men, had the blood of God running through his veins, perfection from start to finish in order to redeem us through his blood some 30 plus years later. But have you ever looked at the family tree of Jesus? Have you ever stopped to take a look at the family tree? Don't forget, Mary had the blood of Adam running through her veins. So let's just take a moment and uh, we, we see that Matthew begins his gospel. Uh, he begins this gospel with the, uh, the ancestors of Christ. Uh, now this is the, the, the Lord's ancestry. Uh, first off, we have liars. We have adulterers, we have murderers, we have cheats, we have idolaters, we have incest, who, unbelief, and most of all, his family tree was full of hypocrites. Now that's our Lord's family tree. Matthew gives it to us for uh, a particular purpose. And Matthew, the author of the gospel, was a former tax collector. The man who wrote this was one of the most hated men. The tax collector was some of the most hated people in Israel. Now, no wonder Matthew was the one who recorded in Matthew 9. He says, it is not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. For I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. How about that? I remember I was in a discussion. I was a young preacher at the time, not so long ago. And uh, I was talking to two old preachers. By the way, both those preachers are in heaven now. Uh, but we were standing in one of their churches and we were talking and one of them was a free will Baptist, one was an independent Baptist, and then you had me, a good old Southern Baptist there. Well, first the free will Baptist uh, made the comment to the two of us. He said, I don't know how you all could uh, believe you couldn't lose your salvation. And uh, then the independent pastor, uh, he jumps in and he starts to defend uh, his view and I'm standing there listening to this, and then the two of them at the same time looked at me and says, how can you sleep at night, and how can you have a good conscience being a Southern Baptist? <laughs> and my comment back to them was, it is the sick that need a physician. <laughs> Sounds like you all are pretty righteous. So I thought of that because of this particular verse right here. But Matthew knew what it was like to be uh, a person that was hated, uh, that was considered unrighteous, was considered an enemy of his people. You know, these tax collectors, they would uh, tax money and then they would, rot, they, they would get whatever traffic uh, bore. In other words, uh, anything over and above uh, what the call tax was for, they could put in their own pocket. Kind of like our politicians today up in Washington, D.C. Kind of, it's the same difference. You got a, a bunch of tax collectors. But anyway, Matthew sure knew a lot of sick people. Uh, Matthew knew that he himself was sick. See, you can't ever come to righteousness through Christ unless you realize you're sin sick, unless you realize your condition. Thankfully, Jesus was really good with sick people. We see that all throughout his walk upon the earth. Just about every type of foolishness and failure you can imagine and happening is uh, in our family trees. You know why? Because there's none righteous, not even one. We all have fallen and come short of the glory of God. We all have inherited sin, and there is no sin in God's eyes that's any greater than any other sin. If you're a long tongue tongue gossip, you're just as bad as a murderer in God's eyes. Now, what am I saying? I'm saying the punishment may be different for different sins here on earth, but in God's eyes, sin is sin. So we inherited this from our father Adam. Now, <clears throat> we see Jesus' ancestry was full of corrupt sinners. Why? Because we're all sinners. 
That's what the Bible teaches us. I heard a song, and uh, I was going to get, I don't have anybody with enough, enough rhythm to do it, but uh, I thought maybe uh, if there's one person that could do it, it would be Matthew Butte to, to do the, the rap background for me. So after, after thinking about this, I decided, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to share the lyrics. And this is, this is uh, uh, something that kind of surprised me when I heard it. It's a song called I'm My Own Grandpa. How many of you have ever heard I'm My Own Grandpa? A few of you. Okay. How does the lyrics go? Uh, <laughs> it says, now many, many years ago when I was 23, I was married to a widow who was as pretty as can be. This widow had a grown-up daughter who had hair of red. My father fell in love with her, and soon the two were wed. Now, this made my, my dad my son-in-law and changed my very life. My daughter was my mother because she was my father's wife. To complicate the matters, even though it brought me joy, I soon became the father of a bouncing baby boy. My little baby then became a brother-in-law to dad and so became my uncle, though it made me very sad. For, for if he was my uncle, that also made him the brother of the widow's grown-up daughter, who, of course, was my stepmother. I'm my own granddad. Now, you think for one minute human beings aren't messed up. Human beings are a messy bunch. And we will continually wrestle with sin in our lives until Jesus takes us home. So, here is Matthew. These are Christ's people. Tamar, incest, Rahab, scandal. This is the ancestry of Christ. Shame of prostitution for Rahab, living, living alone, Ahaz, uh, disgrace of pagan child sacrifice, an ancestor of Christ. To people like this, Jesus, for people like this, Jesus Christ came. And see, we need to remember that. We need to remember why that baby was born in a manger. It wasn't for the righteous. It was for sinners that needed righteousness. And only he could bring that righteousness to the world. Now, in Matthew 1, verses 18 through 25, Matthew tells us that Jesus Christ was truly born in verse 18. The birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. Now, just as everything prior to uh, verse 18, we had the ancestry list, it really happened. Matthew is now telling us that the ultimate event, Jesus' birth, really did happen. This is something that took place. God was born with us. Now, the birth of Jesus is a real factual story. Now, a lot of folks don't want to accept him as God born as a man, but yet that is ex <clears throat> exactly what happened. Now, the... Uh, this historical event, event took place, and the more and more that they uh, have studied and uh, archaeological studies uh, and all of these things, the more proof uh, is, is given of the birth of, of the Savior. Now, we shouldn't miss this. Uh, in all of the trees and all of the lights and all of the Christmas carols and all of the presents that we're going to give our little kitties for Christmas, we must not forget the purpose of this season. Uh, it really happened. The birth of Jesus Christ came about. Jesus, God, was born into this world. Now, I was going to preach from Galatians this morning on at the appointed time. There was a, it was a particular time when he was to be born. Uh, and everything was in place. It was the perfect timing of God as his timing is always. Now, now Matthew tells us about the uh, birth of Jesus. It was through, he was, uh, Mary conceived through the Holy Spirit. Now, that's a load, isn't it? 
That, that's something really. Can you imagine? We believe it through faith. And the reason we believe it through faith is because the Holy Spirit has enabled us to believe it through the quickening power and through making us alive to spiritual things. Other than that, we're spiritually dead. All people are either alive or dead spiritually. In Christ, we're alive. In, uh, in anything else that we worship, whatever it may be, we're dead. Uh, that, that's what the Bible teaches. So we know that this took place. But can you imagine what it must have been like during that period for Mary and for Joseph? Uh, Matthew tells us uh, uh, the way it happened. He says that a, a young Jewish couple, Joseph and Mary, were engaged. Uh, the, they were dating, and Joseph and Mary have remained sexually pure. Uh, however, there was an interesting turn of events that took place. Uh, something unexpected happened. You talk about unexpected if you come up pregnant and you've never had sex. Now, that's unexpected. But yet Mary knew exactly what was going on. Uh, and even more interesting, Mary, uh, Mary is, is, is reported pregnant uh, because of the specific plan of God and the work of the Holy Spirit. Think about that just for a second. Imagine this playing out in Joseph's mind as he considers damage control. Joseph I'm pregnant. You're what? Honestly, I didn't have sex with anybody. It was the Holy Spirit that impregnated me. <laughs> Can you see, Joseph? Are you kidding me? Come on. You could come up with something better than that, couldn't you, Mary? Who have you been messing with? Now, keep in mind, I, I want to bring this into perspective. I want to bring it into what would happen today, you know, uh, if, 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 if somebody, if, let's say your daughter comes home and says, I'm pregnant. And you say, who's the boy? Oh, it's the Holy Spirit. So can you imagine what, what a tumultuous time this had to be for Mary and Joseph and for, for the whole family? Uh, I can imagine Joseph telling his, his buddies, uh, hey, Mary's pregnant. And uh, they say, how? Well, she says the Holy Spirit. Yeah, right, man. I'm just trying to be real here, okay? I mean, this is, this is a hard sale here, a very hard sale. Imagine Joseph having to face Mary's parents. Sir, I promise, I did not touch your daughter. The Holy Spirit impregnated her. Yeah, right, Joseph. Can, can you imagine what they, they must have been going through? And then imagine poor Mary, a virgin, never, had any, never having sexual relationships. And, and by the way, that is the key to who we are as believers is a son. The Son of God was conceived by a virgin with God's blood running through his veins and was born to save us. And the only thing that could save us was the purity of his blood without any of Adam's tainted blood, like all of his ancestors. But he had the blood of, of God running through his veins. Now, uh, Mary's parents, I'm sure that they had a few choice words at this particular time. Now Jesus from the very beginning chooses to affiliate himself with people loaded with shame and loaded with grief. Now then in chapter 1 verse 19, Joseph is a righteous just person. He does not want to disgrace or embarrass Mary. In other words, he's a good guy. And you know she could have been stoned to death for this. I don't know if you're aware of that or not. But uh, it, it's a major disgrace in this culture to be impregnated out of wedlock, by the way. It used to be in our society, but now it's a way to get food stamps. But I won't go there. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I just won't go there, sorry. But anyway, Genesis 2.24, God's plan for marriage and childbirth 
uh, it's very simple. What's God's plan? N not, not what some psychiatrist tells you, not what some teacher tells you, not, not what some liberal TV program tells you or sitcom tells you. What's God's plan when it comes to these things? Well, very simple. The first thing is to leave your parents. More divorces are caused by people never leaving their parents than anything else. But anyway, first off, leave your parents, cleave to your spouse, conceive your children. That's God's plan in a marital relationship. That's good. It's simple. It's one of the most simple things that God gives us in his word. Now, we see that the world's plan is kind of backwards from God's plan. That's why people, uh, that's why lost folks, people that are not saved, that's why they can't stand God because God's plan goes against their flesh. It goes against what they want to do. It goes against their desires. Now, we see from this point, Joseph is considering a, a private break from the engagement. What would you do? Let me, let me place this in your lap, men. What would you do? <laughs> you need a vision, don't you? All right. Joseph has been thinking about these things. I would be thinking about them too. And you know in his heart of hearts he didn't believe her. I mean, this is the first and the last time this has ever happened. This, this is a God thing. This is a God thing. And by the way, let me say something. Mary was a sinner just like the rest of us. She was born through Adam's blood. She was a sinner. There's a joke I heard a long time ago that uh, uh, this guy says, Jesus says, let he without sin cast the first stone. And all of a sudden, whoosh, whoosh, Mom! <laughs> let that sink in just for a second. Mary is human like the rest of us. Mary was blessed in that she was chosen to become the mother of the Messiah. Now, that's a great blessing, but she's not God. You can pray to her. You might as well pray to the wall over here. Because the Bible tells us we have a high priest that lives forever, and it's not Mary to make intercession for us. It's not me down in my office. It's not some preacher or some priest that is going to forgive you of your sins. But we have a high priest that lives forever to make intercession for us. Read it in Hebrews. That's Jesus Christ. We don't need anything else. When we go to Christ for forgiveness, we go to him directly through the Holy Spirit. Isn't that a blessing to know? Aren't you glad you don't have to come to me to have your sins forgiven? I'd tell the whole community what you'd been up to. <laughs> I really wouldn't. <laughs> but, but think about it for a second. We have a high priest that lives forever to make, and, and here's something else good about that. Our high priest lives forever to make intercession for us, and he would have to die again for us to lose our salvation. Right on that a while. Christ would have to die a second death in order, but he will never die again. He died, he become our high priest, we can go to him with our problems. He becomes our king. He becomes our savior. All of these things are all through Christ, this baby that was born in a manger that we're talking about today. So here's what happens. Here's, I, I guess God figured I better let Joseph in on this. <laughs> Don't you think? I better let Joseph in on this. So what happens? An angel comes and says, don't be afraid. Tells Joseph this. I want you to marry Mary. What's going on in her is of the Holy 
spirit. Now, this was a very graphic vision or dream or something that was very graphic and very real when God came to Joseph with this. Uh, you're going to, not only uh, did he tell him what was happening, but he told him what the baby's name would be. His name will be Jesus. Uh, in the Hebrew, it's Yahshua, which is a name we also translate to Joshua, which means Savior. So here's this child that is going to be born, and God gives the name because he is Savior, Yahshua. Now, Jesus is going to save his people from their sins. Now, there's an important lesson that we get here. First off, don't be afraid. That's the first words that he said to Joseph. Believe, but not only believe. Now, this is what he's told to do. Don't be afraid. Believe, obey, and joyfully participate. In other words, enjoy this. God's being born through your wife. Man, that's something else. You know, when things come into our life, when unexpected things happen, we can follow this same pattern that we have here. Uh, first off, don't be afraid. If you believe in God, don't be afraid. Because nothing is going to come into your life that's not supposed to be coming into your life. And secondly, we continue to believe that whatever is happening, we, we believe that, that Christ is the reason that it's happening. Matthew 1, 22, 23, uh, here we're, we see a, a brief transition in the Scriptures. In the Old Testament, the Scripture says He's coming, He's coming, He's coming. And then we see in the Gospels, here He is. He's here. He's here. The Messiah is here. And now we're living in the New Testament. He's coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back. Now you can trust in those things. You can be sure that what God told us will take place. Now the key theme in the Old Testament is uh, Messianic hope. Messiah, the Savior of the Jews. That was the original thinking. They thought he would be a conquering Messiah, a warrior, a war warrior that would, would uh, overturn anybody that comes against Israel. But he was a suffering Savior. We see that in Isaiah 53. We see that he came to suffer and to die to redeem us from our sins. Now the next time he comes back, he's coming back as a warrior. We know that. Now, where's the offspring of woman that will rise to crush the serpent's head? See, that's the first messianic prophecy in Genesis 3:15. Uh, who, who will it be? And this has been speculation throughout the centuries. Who will this Messiah be? Will it be a father like Abraham? Will it be a deliverer like Moses? Will it be a king like David? Will it be a prophet like Elijah? Will it be uh, a priest like Samuel? Will it be a strong judge like Samson? What's the Messiah going to be like? Well, we're told very graphically what the Messiah is going to be like. He's going to suffer. He's going to die. He's going to be rejected by his own people. And uh, in Malachi, after, after the prophet Malachi, there's 400 years of silence. Where's the Messiah? Where's the promised one? 400 years of complete silence. Uh, the heavens were silence. God was silence. Many people have forgotten that there was even a Messiah coming. But in chapter 1, verse 23, but the angel refers back to the prophecy of Isaiah to assure the audience that God is right on time. Isaiah 7, 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. What's the sign? See, the virgin will conceive. Let me tell you something this morning. Anybody that claims to be a born-again believer and denies the virgin birth of Christ, you don't believe. We cannot deny the virgin birth. We cannot deny the deity of God, the inerrancy of Scripture. We cannot deny any of these things and call ourselves a believer, but yet churches are full of people that deny all these things this morning. What good would it do if Christ is not born of a virgin? 
He's got some Roman soldier or somebody's blood running through his veins as the liberals would have you believe, as the liberal churchmen would have you believe. They come up with all kinds of silly theories. Well, Mary was cornered by a Roman soldier and conceived and didn't want anybody to know and blah, 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 blah. Professing to be wise, they become fools. So, if Christ was not virgin born, if you don't believe in the virgin birth, if you don't believe it was a woman that had never had relationship with a man and she conceived by the Holy Spirit, if you don't believe that, you don't have a God that can redeem you. It's that simple. Because only He could redeem. There's no other God. Buddha, uh, all of the, Mohammed, all of these so-called gods, they're buried in the ground somewhere over in the Middle East and their souls are in an eternal hell. But Jesus rose from the grave. He is at the right hand of the Father. He split the veil. He, he overturned the law of Moses. He brought us a new law, a law of grace. Salvation through faith and not works alone. Salvation through his blood and his blood alone. That's who we serve. He's a living Savior. And hey, he's coming again. You ought to shout it out. Shout it out with me. He's Amen. Man, I get excited at Christmas. Without Christmas, we wouldn't have all this good stuff to talk about. But anyway, Jesus is certainly coming again. I got to hurry. Okay. So, the angel refers back to the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. See, the virgin will conceive and have a son and name him Emmanuel. Now, you say, well, why doesn't it say name him Jesus? Because they're simply saying it's God with us. God walking with us. That's simply, i got to really watch it. I'm going to slam my hand if I'm not careful here. I better put this thing in my pile. I have another broke finger. But anyway, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 says, For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us. And look at this. The government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. His dominion will be vast. His prosperity will never end. That's the Messiah. Micah says in Micah 5, 3 and 5, When she who is in labor has given birth, this virgin... He will stand and shepherd them in the strength of the Lord, in the majestic name of the Lord his God. His greatness will extend to the ends of the earth. He will be his people's peace. We have peace through Christ because we're his people. You know, we're the New Testament, his people. We're the elect of God chosen before the foundation of the world. We're the people that at the appointed time that God came to and quickened us and showed us what low down and dirty sinners we are through the blood of Adam and says, you need a savior. And all we could do is cry out for mercy to a holy God because he was willing to redeem us and pay the price that had to be paid in order for us to have life. I never get tired of that story, do you? If you get tired of that story, you need to re-examine yourself. How can you ever get tired of the story that God himself planned and formulated before the foundation of the world a way to redeem his people and to save you from who you are in Adam and give you eternal life? You'll appreciate it one day. I can most assuredly tell you that. When we are taken into the presence of the king, we'll shout it out. I'll hear my old buddy, buddy Art saying, glory. I didn't think you'd make it, Brother Allen. I can hear him now. <laughs> and I'll say, but for the grace of God, Brother Art, but for the grace of God. My goodness. Now, let me hurry. I know y'all are in a hurry to beat everybody to the restaurant. Get your pre-Christmas Eve, pre-Christmas uh, supper. So anyway, let's move right along here. Now, here's the three things the angel promises. A virgin will become pregnant. She will give birth to a son. And the son will be called Emmanuel, or God with us. Now, this is a, an important lesson. 
No wonder Luke 2 describes the heavenly angelic host bursting on the scene and praising God with a loud chorus of verses. Angels has been watching this unfold for a couple of years. No. Angels have been watching this unfold for thousands of years. The angels are kind of like, what in the world? Why, 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 why all this stuff about these crazy humans? I, the angels never knew, and I don't know. But thank God he formulated a plan. Angels knew that there had been many years of silence. Now, here comes Jesus, and it's time to sing and shout, shout it from the mountains. So God has a pattern. God often shows up in the biggest, the best, and the most beautiful ways, and the most unexpected ways possible. He'll show up in dark times. He'll show up in hard times. He'll show up in unexpected times. But when God shows up, you know that it was God that showed up. Now, I don't know if you've ever had him show up in a difficult time of your life, but I have. And I want to tell you, when things unexpected happen, and we don't know which way we're going to turn, and when we cry out, God, where are you? And he shows up. He gets all the glory. I was talking about my grandson, his ball playing there a minute ago. And I said he gets it all from me. Well, let me tell you, he doesn't get anything from me. He got it from his dad. His dad should receive all the praise for what he's done with his two children, Brennan and Braden. God receives all the glory and all of the praise for what he's done for us. It's that simple. And when he shows up, it's a time to praise God. You know, we fail as Christians. Let me say this this morning. We fail miserably as Christians when we don't testify and praise God when, when, when a God thing happens in our life. How many of you have set on a God thing because you're too embarrassed to say anything are you afraid somebody will think you're uh, a, a, a holy Joe or something? You ought to be a holy Joe if you got God in you for crying out loud. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some, some Christians are ashamed of who they are, ashamed of Christ. If God has done something at an unexpected time for you, you ought to stand and glorify him. I know I've gone a little longer than normal, but I'm almost done. I'm not preaching tonight, so look at the bright side, all right? So anyway, uh, in uh, chapter 1, verses 24 and 25, listen to what Joseph does. He waits, he obeys, he marries, he remains pure, and he named the child Yeshua or Jesus. He did exactly what God told him to do. Now Joseph, uh, he heard, he believed, he obeyed. Now the fact is, when you know God is with you, you can wake up and you can do anything if you trust in the Lord. Unexpected things will happen in our lives. You may have something unexpected that's going to happen to you before this year's up. You got a whole year. Do you ever think when we start a new year, do you ever think, or how, how do you think? Oh, Lord, here comes another year. I hope it's better than last year. What's that called, Marcus? Appalachian what? Appalachian fatalism. It's a beautiful day out, isn't it, ma'am? Yeah, but it's going to rain. Lord, did you hear it's supposed to snow next week? We're supposed to get three inches. Don't forget to get your bread and milk. Y'all, man, hey, I'm from this area, too. That's my wife, man. I can get real negative sometimes. My daughter's on me all the time about it. The other night, that ball game, I said, well, looks like we're going to have to play for third place tomorrow night with 5.4 seconds left. And Braden goes down and sinks the shot. And Kim says, you're so negative, Dad. <laughs> That's that Appalachian fatalism sitting in on your preacher. 
But unfortunately, isn't it true? My wife told a story when she was in oral surgery. There was a woman would come in, and she'd hear her all the way down the hall. Oh, my mouth's on fire. I can sure use some. It's funny in one way, but it's tragic in another way. We got some northern folks that go to our church. It ain't like that way up north. I'm going to tell you why the north won the war, because of Appalachian fatalism. That's exactly why they won. Them northern people, they get up, they're out of bed early in the morning, they go out in sub-zero temperatures and go to work. And when they have church on Sunday, you may have 14 foot of snow and a wind chill factor of 20 below zero, and they'll be at church on Sunday. Well, preacher, I didn't make it to church this Sunday. It was raining a little bit. That's why them dang Yankees won the war, because I can't get out in the rain. We're all guilty of it. Everybody that's born and raised here, we're all guilty of it. There's no question about it. You try your best to overcome it. But the fact of the matter is, when unexpected things happen, we need to call upon God. And when God answers our request, and when he turns it around, we need to give him praise for it. And not sit on our hands and say nothing. But anyway, God often shows up in the biggest and the best and the most beautiful ways when we least expect it. In dark times and hard times and divorces and death and all of these things. Uh, chapter 1, 24, 25 says, verses, listen to what Joseph does. He wakes up, he obeys, he marries, he remains pure, and he named the child Jesus as he was told. Uh, now, when you know God is with you, you can wake up and you can do anything if you set your mind to it. Our church is an example. I'm not going to go there this morning, but our facilities are an example of that. Harold, would you have ever dreamed 31 years ago that God would do here what he's done over the last 31 years? I wouldn't have. I, I probably was one of the most negative people around during that period, you know. And, and then I couldn't sleep at night once we got the plan set forward and God kept prompting me and prompting me and I kept leading the church to go there and then I'd go to bed and I'd oh, how in the world are we going to pay for that? We'll never get that building paid for, for crying out loud. That ain't going to cost us almost $800,000 and we got to get that land. We ain't never going to get that land. What did God do, Harold? It was a miracle. What happened? I'm almost done. Okay. Uh, when life seems confusing, when life seems impossible, we need clarity and truth on who we serve. We need to understand who we serve. We can trust him. We can trust him to be true to his words. The message of Matthew 1, 18 through 25 is that God is with us and we can trust him. And this message is for all believers. So I praise God this morning that I serve a God that can do something. When an unexpected bad news comes, uh, we can trust that God will see us through. Maybe you're young and going to a new job, a brand new school or something. Maybe you've gotten out of rehab. Maybe you're having drug problems, alcohol problems. Oh, yeah, that happens in churches sometimes. We sometimes forget that we're hospitals for sinners. Maybe this is a Christmas for you after a death of a loved one. Or maybe this is a Christmas for you after a messy divorce and your heart broken. You know, that's just, that's almost as devastating as death. Perhaps that's your case. Maybe this is the first Christmas after a great financial loss in your life. 
Maybe you're in that tough spot of life where you have an aging parent who needs your assistance and needs your help. Hey, these things happen, folks. And we have got to trust in God during these times more than any other time. Do you believe that God is with you? I'll tell you this first. If you're not born again by the blood of Christ, he's not with you. I'm just being honest. He is not with you if you're not a child of his. If you've not been born again and you're looking to him and trusting in him for your salvation. There's only two kinds of people in the world, servants of Satan and servants of Jesus Christ. And let me tell you, Satan won't get you through the hard times. He'll kill you if he gets a chance, but he won't get you through the hard times. If you're born of the Spirit of God this morning, you have the greatest hope anybody could have. If you're not, you have no hope at all. I don't care if you're a multimillionaire. I don't care if you live on a mansion on the hill or in the valley. I don't care if you drive a Rolls Royce. I don't care if you got more money than God, some people say. You're on your way to an eternal hell without Jesus Christ. Bob Dylan had a song many years ago when he went through his born again faith. You got to serve somebody. It might be the devil. It might be the Lord. But you got to serve somebody. Who are you serving today? Let me ask you that question. If you're not serving God and God has seen fit to convict your spirit with his Holy Spirit this morning, I want to invite you to come. We're only going to take a moment. I'm not going to take a lot of time during this, this invitation because we got to couple other things that we need to do but anyway I want you to come if God's speaking to your heart today let us stand at this time bow your heads close your eyes